So Shabbat Shalom again, everyone. It is good to be together. I give this sermon a title. It's called Scenes from a Marriage. I don't know how many of you uh, saw the five-part series on HBO, Can I See, by a show of hands. So a good number of you have, and um, I'm glad about that. And after I saw the last segment, I was pretty determined to find a way to speak about it. But I didn't expect it to happen this quickly, or in fact, the scene from a marriage to be um, played out in a certain way in this week's Parsha, which opened it up for me. And for, our, for the young couple, for Andrew and Heather, I would say, uh, what's that? <laughs> No, it's, I think everyone should watch it. I think young couples should watch it. So it's, it's just that it points to a certain uh, dimension of being that we don't like to think about when we're in the thrust of romance. And I'm going to talk about that. So the uh, series was based on Igmar uh, Bergman's Scenes from a Marriage from 1973. And actually, after my wife and I, after Toby and I saw the first segment, we went back and watched Bergman's film. It's a long film. This version was written and directed by Haggai Levy. He's an Israeli um, writer and an, Isra an Israeli uh, filmmaker. And it featured the exceptional acting of both Jessica Chastain and Oscar Isaac, who's relative, relatively new on the scene and quite, quite a great actor. It is very painful, just like the original from 1973. It's the story of the agonizing decisions which are made in a particular marriage, reflecting agonizing decisions that are made in life. This version was very real, and as I mentioned, there were five one-hour segments. For those of you who like drama and films that will go deeper into the minds, the psyches, and the spirit of people, I highly recommend it if you have not yet seen it. And although this talk may give away some of the, uh, some of the um, uh, events of the film, of the series, it's okay. It's still worth seeing. Over the years, my approach when I would meet couples who were getting married has shifted. I have moved from a focus on starry-eyed romanticism, why they fell in love, what it was like to be in love, and aspects of marriage uh, preparations and the ceremony, to a more accurate or focused reflection on what marriage is like for 99% of couples. And although every one of us has our own unique aspects and there are the unique dimensions to every marriage, there are certain similarities in relationship that every couple share. We know that a glass is broken at the end of a ceremony under the chuppah. And traditionally, the breaking of the glass has to do with balancing the joy of the moment, the sense of unification, with the reality of pain in life and the destruction of Jerusalem. But the symbolism is actually much greater. And in fact, it may be connected to the very idea that stuff breaks. So in the ceremony, we move from a cup that's filled with wine twice, symbolizing that the moment is overflowing with sweetness, to a broken glass. I frequently will tell a couple that the success of a marriage will depend on how they deal with the moments when glasses are broken. Obviously, that's a metaphor for facing life's challenges. The things aren't always joyful and things are not always wonderful. As a rabbi, I choose books that I give couples who come to their initial meetings with me. For years, I only gave guides to Jewish marriage, explanation of what takes place under the chuppah, what's expected of a Jewish husband and a Jewish wife. But I don't any longer. 
In addition to the guides, I still give those guides, but in addition to the guides, I give every bride and groom a novel. It's entitled The Course of Love. And the novel is written by a French author, philosopher, and psychologist named Alain de Bouton. It's a fascinating book because it does the following. It follows the progression of a relationship between a couple from the moment they meet throughout their years together. And what de Baton does is he intersperses the storyline of the novel with a critical examination as to what's happening to that couple as they go through the various stages of life, the development and the evolution of their relationship and love. And he intersperses it in italics. And what I learned after I, or what I perceived after I read this novel the first time was, it's not just about this particular couple. It's really about all couples. And so my purpose in giving them this book, and by the way, I have extra copies for you guys, <laughs> is to help them understand that neither their love nor their relationship will be perfect. Entering into any new situation with false expectations is at best unsettling. And romantic notions in Western culture have in fact been very disruptive to people's realities. So hear this, let's turn to the Parsha and a scene from a marriage. The first Hebrew couple. In chapter 12, right after God tells Avram that his descendants will inherit the land, a famine forces Avram and his family to leave Canaan. They are to seek food in Egypt. Before arriving, Avram tells, Avram tells Sarai that she should lie about her identity. If she says that she is his wife, they will likely kill him and they will take her. But if she says that she is his sister, they'll leave Avram alone and without any consideration as to what will happen to Sarai. And we know the story. So God comes to the rescue, saves her, brings a plague upon Pharaoh who releases Avram and then showers Avram and his people with gifts. Essentially, God sees who he's dealing with here. And it's not Avram, but it's Avram's God. And he wants him simply to get away from Egypt. Now we know that Bible scholars have taught us about something called the wife-sister motif in ancient Near Eastern literature. But the story that we have is the story. That's the story. Avram tells his wife Sarai, pretend you're my sister. Let him take you so I'll be saved. Well, suppose Avram's private email account was tapped, like what happened to Gruden, and we saw his attitude towards his wife, his attitudes towards women. Perhaps, if he lived today, he would be canceled. His standing amongst the people would have to be reconsidered. But we don't do that, just the opposite. We take these figures from our past and in spite of the difficulties, the challenges, and their imperfections, we learn from them. So the next episode involves Sarah in chapter 16. A childless Sarah gives her handmaid Hagar to Avram so that together they might produce a child. And Hadar does, Had, Hagar does become pregnant and she has Ishmael and Sarah begins to treat her with disdain. At this point, Sarah turns to Avram and says, Hamasi Alecha, I am really angry with you. And rather than intervening in this, Avram tells Sarah to, well, then you do what you want. She treats Hagar harshly. She causes her to flee into the desert with her little baby boy. We often say and we often hear and we actually take great pride in the fact that the founders of our people our forefathers and mothers, and all the important people in our tradition were imperfect human beings. They were human. 
They made mistakes. They did wrong. They had relationships that were terribly challenged. They deceived each other, and it caused great harm. And we see it with Avram and Sarah. We see it with Rivka and Leah. We see it with Rachel and Yaakov, with Judah and Ruvain and Joseph. But we don't take these imperfect actors out of our script. In fact, as I said, we learn from them. So one of the great challenges that we've been hearing about in our cultures over the last few weeks has to do with Facebook and TikTok, TikTok and Instagram, particularly as it relates to kids and teenagers because it promotes images of beauty, ideal weights, possessions, things that kids have to have, how they have to dress. It's about their relationships and even their moods and the way they should be looking. And so kids end up feeling pretty badly about themselves because they don't look like these perfect young models or their bodies certainly aren't perfect. And they don't dress the way they see these kids dressing or they don't dress that way yet. They feel they have to have those clothing. They lose a sense of self. They lose a sense of self-worth. And so what it's done to a population is it's created a great deal of insecurity, sadness, challenges to self-image, and even depression or worse. If we're not perfect, then how can we be? Yesterday in my Friday morning Parsha class, and it's not a Parsha class actually, it's a class where we're reading through the entire narratives of the Torah. We came to Parsha Hukim. We read about the perfect para aduma that was brought to be sacrificed for purification. That's the red heifer. It's a fascinating section we know that has to do with, well, we're not really sure, right? We learn that there's a category of law that is known, known as hukim, laws that are given without a rational understanding. And so this, of course, opens up interpretation. And one of the interpretations that we read was, there can't be a perfect para aduma because the para aduma had every single hair on its body the same color. And that just doesn't happen. Or it's nearly impossible, if not impossible. And what this interpreter said is, it comes to teach us that there cannot be perfection. And so the para aduma in the Torah is destroyed. Our friend who's in the class, Morley Goldberg, said, perfection is the enemy of excellence. And I've often heard it framed in a different way, that perfection is the enemy of the good. So we live in a social world of, with great materialism. Beauty is sanctified. Things that are owned are honored. And there's pressure to have it all and to have it just right. But what we learn as we get older is it's just not possible. Along the way, we find obstacles. There are problems with health. We experience loss. We age. And I believe then that our tradition is telling us that in so many different ways when it gives us the models of our ancestors. Because aspirations for perfection destroy our very sense of well-being. You all know that. You know that from the way you work, from work. You know that from your relationships with your spouses or your kids or your parents. You know that even from trying to keep your house the way you think it should be kept. Aspirations for perfection destroy our sense of well-being. So we recognize human imperfection and we build it into our system. Why is it okay that we come together on Yom Kippur and we confess all of our sins publicly? Because we all do. And we're to know that. We all make mistakes. We all fail at times. Those things that we value the most 
often don't work out well. I cannot begin to tell you how many times people have come to my office to speak to me about some issue in their home, in their family. And then after talking for a little bit, they retreat a little bit and they express some kind of embarrassment to me. They say, Rabbi, I've just revealed a lot of the skeletons that exist in my family's closet. I bet around here you don't hear that much. And I have to say to them, no, not true. Not true at all. Everybody has them. Don't say that. Just don't say that because you are part of an imperfect family like every other family in the world. We used to put a lot of energy into closeting issues like alcoholism and drug use, affairs, depression, mental health. If they didn't reflect common human issues, we thought of ourselves as being different and we felt that we were pariahs because this was in our family. And that added to the pain. So much wasted effort trying to hide imperfection and challenge. So much wasted effort trying to hide the dysfunction in our systems when everybody has them. Grandparents, and I'm in that club now, as you know, we suffer from this a lot. There's a tendency, uh, a tendency, not at all a tendency, it's a compulsion to kind of present our kids as being perfect, our grandkids as being perfect, but we know they're not. And by doing so, we create more problems with false expectations. Often it comes from the parent or grandparent who sees themselves as having all the knowledge because of their experience and constantly wanting to direct their kids or their grandkids to give their opinions and to give their judgments. We want our kids to learn from our experience because God, we know so much. But you know what they're gonna learn from? They're gonna learn from their own experiences and they're gonna learn from their own mistakes and their own failures. And in the meanwhile, what we do is we hurt the relationships. It's much better that we should have bruised and bitten tongues than we should say everything and consistently give our opinion as to the way things should be. So the world was created. And what we learned after a Parsha is that it wasn't a perfect world. What we learn in our tradition that there is even imperfection in the model of God which we present. It's built into creation. And yet we can say it was good. Other religions teach about absolute faith and absolute truths and singular behaviors and one and only one meaning, but not us. Over and again, we hear here that we build a people around difference, diversity, difficulty, uncertainty, and disagreement. And so our comfort then is found in our acceptance of the imperfect, our acceptance of imperfection. That's what makes the community run well also. We can accept each other even when we make mistakes, but I wouldn't stop there. I'm not saying things don't matter. I'm not saying mistakes aren't something to be learned from and to grow from because we do believe in the good. And we don't stop striving for excellence, but we have to have perspective and perspective is so difficult for perfectionists. So let me get back to scenes from a marriage. I guess this is a bit of a spoiler alert, but this isn't, it's not like a football game where the outcome is everything. This is much more about the process. We begin with some really bad feelings about Mira, the wife, because she's made a bad choice, an immoral choice. And we can't understand how she, a wife and a mother, can neglect the love of Jonathan and ultimately turn her back on a husband and a child and a family. And if you're like me, you were really disturbed by her. But we also learn as the series unfolds what her deep disappointment and challenges are all about. As we learn about more in their relationship and as we learn about more from her background. 
Nevertheless, we're disturbed by her decisions. And then when we arrive at the end, we see two people who are battered and bruised by love and relationship. We see the great power of their attraction and the destruction that their passion and lack of full awareness brings. And then there's another surprise, right? Jonathan claims that he spent so much energy throughout his life on trying to be good, trying to be moral, trying to be just, trying to be perfect, and so that he questions why. He said, most people aren't like that. Most men don't behave like that. Most men don't carry that burden of guilt. And so what happens is he actually confuses being good and being perfect. And he throws away the right choice. He throws away the choice of being good. In fact, he throws away the moral choice, which would preserve trust and the sanctity of relationship and the sanctity of a marriage, a marriage now to another child, with another child. It's as if he's saying, since it's not perfect, it doesn't have to be good. And that's not what we believe. I believe that we may be in part essentially in a search, in desires, for something, and it doesn't have to be for the perfect. We need to aspire towards the good, towards that which is right, towards excellence, knowing at the same time, nothing is perfect. So Avram is chosen, why? To create a people who will aspire towards Sedek and Mishpat, and we never have fully gotten there, but we don't give up trying. And in our own lives and in our own relationships, the acceptance of our own imperfection, and yes, the imperfection of those we love, is what will truly help us find the peace that we desire, find the love that is so rewarding, and even find a lot of happiness. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Turn to page 155. We continue with the Musaf service. We rise. For the Hatsi Kaddish.